I welcome Ms. Lakshmi A, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Shishankara Vidya Pedam, Pedambabu. And we are privileged to have you here in this platform from FASAB, associating with FASAB, Additional Skill Efficient Program, it is initiative of Higher Education Department. So I welcome again Ms. Lakshmi A to this session. Thank you, Sridhi. Oh, okay. First of all, I would like to thank SAP for giving me this opportunity. Hello, everyone. I'm Srilakshmi AR, Assistant Professor of English, Srishikara Vidya Vidyam College. Today, I'm before you to present the American classic novel, Hobby Dick, written by Herman Melville. Today, we shall be discussing uh, in an introduction, dedication, etymology, extracts, summary, epilogue characters and themes so without much delay let us proceed into uh, the introduction of the great work one of the most striking aspects of herman melville's mopedic is its baffling complexity and its stunning ability to demolish genre boundaries even after several detailed readings of the novel the reader is bound to ask is mopedic a scientific dissertation or an autobiography, or a travelogue, or an anthology, or a book of quotations, or an encyclopedia, or a detective story, or a philosophical treatise. In fact, the possibilities are simply infinite. The truth is that an amazing interpenetration of genres takes place in Moby Dick, and the novel has within its matrices elements of innumerable genres. It is this universal structure of Mobidic that renders it capable of interpreting the world and practically everything in it. To Mobidic, the world is a semiotic, that is, a system of signs to be read, interpreted, analyzed, evaluated, and comprehended. Therein lies the greatness of this of Melville's magnum opus. Let's have a brief introduction of Melville. Herman Melville was born in the 1st of August in 1819 in New York City. He was born in a, a very renowned family which uh, had a great role in shaping of America. His works include Taipei, Homo, Mardi, um, then Moby Dick, etc. And his short stories include cock a doo doo The Happy Failure, and The Bell Tower. See, the happy failure is an oxymoron which you all are familiar with. His worst poem is Battle, Pieces and Aspects of War. This great poet, I mean, the great novelist, uh, could never win a reputation in his lifetime. Actually, this classic work gained its present reputation in the 100th celebration of the great work. So before we move into the slide, I mean, the work in particular, let us uh, know what the background information we can have it. This particular work, Mopi Dick, was titled based on an earlier work titled Mocha Dick or the White Whale of the Pacific Islands. It was published in Knickerbocker Magazine in 1839 and the author Jeremiah Reynolds detailed the capture of a giant sperm whale, legendary among the whalers for its vicious attacks. Actually, the whale was titled Mocha Dick because it was found in the islands near Mocha, I mean, in near the Mocha Islands. So, Poppy Dick or the White Whale was published in 1851. For the work, Melville drew inspirations on great writers like Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Thomas De Quincey, Mary Shelley, Charles Lamb, etc. In the dedication of this work, we find this, that it is dedicated to the great American novelist, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Hope you are familiar with Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne is very much popular in the early American fiction writing uh, with his great work, the Scarlet Letter. These three slides discuss the contents of the chapter of the work actually. We have 
and etymology extracts followed by 135 chapters and finally an epilogue. You all know what etymology is, right? Etymology, will be, etymology is actually about the root of words. It is a science that studies the root of words. Okay, so in the next slide, you will be seeing certain words. All these words are synonyms of the word way in various languages, ranging from Hebrew to Spanish and Aramangan. Followed by the etymology, Melville puts us a vast section titled Extracts. He says it is provided by a sub sub librarian. I would like to quote just a line as touching the ancient authors generally, as well as the poets here appearing, these extracts are solely valuable for entertaining as affording a glancing bird's eye view of what has promiscuously said, thought, fancy, and son of Leviathan by many generations, including our own. So dear students, we now understand what the, what the hectic work Melville has been doing, collecting every particular excerpt on Wales. These are a few quotations from this excerpt. He quotes from Genesis, Job, Jonah, Psalms, and even literary works like the Wales song. Okay, so to quote Genesis, and God created great Wales. To God, whale song, oh, the rare old whale, did storm and gale in his ocean home will be a giant in might where might is right and king of the boundless sea. So, collecting every excerpt on whales and marine literature was a hectic job. This dedication, what Melville has done before writing such a great work of his lifetime make us clear how dedicated he was in this work. We'll be looking at the summary of the work, the summary of the event in all the 135 chapters are. I shall uh, help you with a briefing of the summary. The opulent marine saga comprises 135 chapters with an intertwining of narrative and essayistic portion, as well as an epilogue and front matter. The first chapter commences with one of the recognizable narratorial opening in the world of literature. Call me Shmi. Yes, students, have you ever heard a better opening? Have you ever heard another narrator asking to call him this name? So this is the most thought provoking narration and a literary piece of work can ever have. Though experienced in sea voyages in merchant ships, Ishmael, the observant youth from Manhattan, desires to have a whaling expedition. Thus, he happens to arrive at Spouter Inn in New Bedford on a cold, stormy December night and reluctantly agrees to share a bed with a stranger who turns out to be heavily tattooed Polynesian harpooner named Pitbeck. Here, I would like to remind you the autobiographical elements of Melville as well. Remember, he, ha he had some time uh, spending with the Polynesian tribes. So the most famous character Pitbeck could be one he gained from his autobiographical experiences. They sign on with Picot from Nant uh, Nantucket, that's the place, and Picot is the ship they are signing in. So Ahab is the ship's captain, a grand, ungodly, godlike man. See the description of Ahab. Ahab is one of the protagonists of the novel. Actually, we have a few dominant characters in the work. As the title says, Moby Dick, as you have already been familiar with right now, that is the white whale. Then we have Ishmael, the narrator, and Ahab. Ahab is the 
captain of the ship and you remember the name of the ship, right? That is Pickard. They sign on with the Pickard with Pickard being the more attractive employee due to his excellence with Harpoon. Pickard is a Harpooner, so he had, he had great experiences in uh, shipping and uh, whaling beforehand. So he was given better fare, I mean better remuneration. And we have Ishmael who just doesn't uh, expect too much. He just wants to be a sailor. So he is given less than what he demands. We find another character, Elijah, a doom raggedly prefect who catches Ishmael and Pickwick on the dog and hints at some trouble with Ahab. The mystery continues and Ishmael sports dark figures in midst of the Christmas morning, apparently boarding the Picard shortly before it sets sail. So they start a bit of uh, their voyage early. I mean, they have, they're preponing the schedule of their voyage. Uh, they start, they set the sail a bit early. The early voyage is directed by the ship's officers like Starbuck, Stub, Flask. These three are the mates. Starbuck is the chief mate. Stub is the second mate and Flask is the third mate. Then we know the captain. Captain is Ahab. Ahab is an imposing, frightening figure whose haunted visage set, sends shivers down the spine of Narita. So his description is a very elaborate and actually quite an interesting one too. He has a white scar. It is supposed to be from a thunderbolt, says others runs down his face. He has a grim, determined look. His one leg is missing. We understand later that that particular leg was maimed by the titular, the titular character of our work, that is Moby Dick. And hence, the missing leg is replaced by a prosthesis fashioned from another sperm whale jewel. Remember, uh, this particular work, this just like how we can take pearls from an ocean. We can uh, get resources of immense varieties from an ocean. This particular work is a combination of lots and lots and lots of disciplines. Okay, uh, here we can even take uh, our interest to uh, that disability studies if required, because Ahab is basically a maimed man. Ahab, with his stirring address, gathers the crewmen together and beseeches, that is, requests their support in his single purpose for this voyage. Hunting down and killing Moby Dick, the white whale, which is a very large sp uh, sperm whale with a snow white head. Remember, students, that everyone goes to a voyage to get some resources from the sea or the ocean. But here, our captain. He has one supreme interest, that is hunting down and killing Moby Dick, the white whale, which is a very large sperm whale with a snow white head. So isn't it something uh, crazy, rather mad or spiteful act? Think about it. He offers a doubloon for one who sports a white whale. See, he's that crazy that he goes to that extent he offers reward to the person who finds the whale for the first time, which way? Obedient. Only Starbuck resists the charismatic, monomaniacal captain. He debates and repeatedly says that the ship's purpose should be to gather whale oil and return home safely. So, as of now, we understand that Ahab is a bit monomaniacal. He is only after Moby Dick, whereas all other members in the ship Pickard is for a livelihood. The mystery of dark figures is explained during the voyager's first chase. Ahab has secretly brought his on board crew, led by an ancient Asian named Ferela, an instructable figure. Later, while guarding a captured whale on night, Fedela tells Ahab of prophecy of Ahab's death. 
See here, we have some biblical references of Elijah. Elijah, Fedela, all these characters actually uh, see having some reference to the mythical and biblical nature. By locating oil leak, Pickwick become deathly ill and orders a canoe shaped or a canoe shaped coffin from the ship's carpenter. And now uh, Pickwick becomes ill. As I told you before, Pickwick is a Polynesian uh, tribal man, an Aborigine, a savage like person tattooed over all over his body. And we find a Christian Ishmael. But these two people are refined and savage persons. They share some friendship together. Okay, uh, so everyone is unhappy about this Pickwick getting killed because he's an excellent harpooner. He's the nicest friend of uh, Ishmael. But to everyone's surprise, he gets uh, safe soon. He recovers. Later, the coffin serves as uh, the life boy of Ishmael that we will come across uh, later. Also, there are numerous GAMs in the novel. GAMs means the social yeah, meetings of two ships on the uh, sea. We know that the Picard is sent to sea. They have started their voyage for three years. So naturally, meeting other people would be an occasion of joy. So it is through these GAMs they know of what's happening on the land and also they exchange mails and uh, other newspapers and all uh, through these occasions of camps. So, social meetings of two ships in the open sea, that is what is called camps. Crews normally visit each other during a camp, captains on one vessel and chief mates on the other. Newspapers and mails are exchanged. I told you this already. So, Ahab is concerned only about one thing. And what's that? He just wants to know one question. Has seen the white way? Some have. The captain of Samuel Enderby closed an arm to this particular way. The Rachel also has seen more it. Dear students, remember. Samuel Enderby and the Rachel are the names of the ships. We never add the before. Uh, we never add the before a super, you know, right? Uh, we never add the before a name. So the Rachel means it is a ship. Okay. The captain of the Rachel begs Ahab to aid in his in the search of his lost son. That is uh, Rachel's captain wants Ahab to help him in, uh, to find his son, but he doesn't approve. For Ahab, he believes that he is very much near the white way, and hence he doesn't want to talk to help another person and get delayed in the process of seeking revenge to that great creature. Ahab is the first to spot Moby Dick for three days the crew pursues the great way who repeatedly turns on Picard's boat, wreaking destruction and killing Fedela, sinking the Picard and dragging Ahab into the sea and his death. Only Ishmael survives, clinging to Picard's coffin. He floats for a day and night before the Rachel disputes him. See this final statement, please. Ahab obviously sports Moby Dick for the first time because he was always into this. He has been searching, finding his, uh, the trails of Moby Dick's path. Even he, he had maps of frequent paths Moby Dick follows. So after three days of rigorous search, what happens to the ship and the crew? The Pickard is destructed. The, the Pickard is destroyed. Everyone in the Pickard except fear Ishmael gets killed. Ahab is actually dragged into the, dragged by the Obedic. So there is an epilogue following. In the epilogue, 
Melville provides a practical solution to one of the early criticisms of the novel. The epilogue was added after the first British printing, which drew criticism because the story appeared to be told by a dead man. The conclusion unites themes of friendship and death, suggesting that it is Quicket's love for his friend that saves Ishmael. So, dear friends, now let's look at the character sketch. I mean, all the names you have seen, you're seeing on your left, are actually the names of the ship, as you know already. The Picard is the ship where Ahab and his crew members are. The other ships you have can see. Ishmael is a narrator. Ishmael and Quicket have a close uh, friendship. Dago, Tashtigo, Pipet are harpooners. Fedela is secretly brought by Ahab. Stub, Starbuck, and Flask are the shipmates. Pip is a boy who is very much, atta very much attached to Ahab. So, hope you are all familiar with the summary of the novel as of now. Uh, now, let us look at the characters of the novel. As you have already noticed, these characters, they are all very much special, aren't they? Think about Ahab. How many monomaniacal characters have you seen across in the liberal literature? Think about Ishmael. See what he knows and what he knows not. He is such an expert, such an expert, such an adept, right? So, Ishmael is a narrator of the novel. He is a keen observer, a young man with an open mind who is very, that is careful of Ahab, but like most of the crew, swept away by the captain's charisma. Ishmael is a young man, actually. Uh, he doesn't carry any baggage. He's a light traveler, but he has an attitude. He has a keen observation. He has a philosophy of his own. See, he doesn't want to earn too much, and he is just happy with whatever things he get in the voyage. Uh, we have more and more and more to say about Ishmael, Ahab, and all these characters, but within our time limit, let us focus now on what is most required. See the wonderful biblical uh, reminiscence of Ahab. Ahab in but in the Bible was an old king. Here, actually a wicked king. Okay? Here the Ahab is uh, here we have a description of Ahab as the grand, ungodly, godlike man. He's a deeply complex figure. Yeah, why I say he is a deeply complex figure is that he finds some sort of softness towards Ishmael at some occasions. Some sort of attachment towards Pip the small boy. But more or less, he is just focused on one thing to find that particular creature who maimed him, who took away his leg to seek revenge, to destroy the creature. That's the only thing Ahab is centered about. Actually, he is one of the most controversial in American literature. His monomaniacal hunt for Moby Dick dominates the novel's flow. So, Ahab is as grand as Moby Dick. Then Moby Dick, obviously the titular hero of the novel, he is the giant sperm whale. And uh, critics say that he seems to manipulate his contradictions with mankind in a manner beyond the capacity of the Leviathan. You know, Leviathan is the word uh, used to for, uh, used to refer whale, actually. Critics debate the nature of Moby Dick, whether he is an allegorical representation of some eternal power, a representation of Ahab's opposition, or nothing more literary than a whale. So as I told you already, Moby Dick is beyond the grasp of our understanding. See, he is a huge phenomenon. I mean, it is a huge phenomenon. Then, uh, 
what shall we think about morbidic no one is able to see morbidic in its entirety no one is able to locate it no i mean control it no one is able to defeat it so what does melville try to convey with this particular white veil and see the color the white veil it's no white head isn't it amazing so there are other characters like pig peg uh, father maple starbuck pedela pip elija stark hurt gabriel bildad etc so about pig peg he is a wonderful person actually pig peg is a polynesian harpooner who opens ishmael's mind and eventually and indirectly saves his life father maple is the son father maple is a spiritual leader actually he is a father in the in the and in the household of actually uh, father maple is the father in father in the shrine of uh, in a church of antiquity and there his sermons veilman's chapel see he was he had his oceanic experiences earlier so his chapel is shaped like a ship and all his sermon is similar is taken from jona okay so there is a symbolic meaning in father maple's sermon we have starbuck we know starbuck he's a quaker and he's a chief mate then we have fedela fedela is the ancient asian harpooner who i have who i have is bringing without anybody knowledge he brings fedela in secrecy so we also know that he prophesies ahab's death it is something that goes in line with elijah's prophecy remember elijah he was the man who quickwick and ishmael met before they said to the voyage we have pip a cabin boy the cabin boy who nearly drowns when he is abandoned during a whale hunt he discovers painful insights that allow him an unusual view of reality and temporarily endear him to her imagine a small boy uh, being lost in the sea without anyone helping him out so we know that it is ishmael who is bringing back the boy to life such a boy gradually get endeared to ahab elijah is a cryptic prophet who helps to set an early tone of dark mystery in the novel he alerts ishmael to possible problems with ahab and secrets about the pickard stab is the second mate he considers himself to be quite the wit but his treatment of fleece the cook is more cruel and racist than it is amusing we know that pickard is a ship with only male characters we know that right so the for three years they are going into the sea so naturally there is no scope of uh, female characters in that particular area uh, i mean age era age and era so there is some sort of racism see all the captains all the upper officials everyone is white but other people are you know the harpooners and other low rank employees are slaves or from africa amrita v has has raised a question why ahab is called a blasphemous hero uh amrita we have many references and in, uh, instances where we can see ahab is a blasphemous hero exactly see uh ahab doesn't concentrate on getting whales hunted getting whale oil and going back once they have created enough profit once they have made enough profit ahab doesn't cater to they still listen to any of the positive comments rather positive 
pieces of advice offered by the cabas i mean offered by starbuck the first me offered by the father meekful advised by his own wife he doesn't listen to any such advice he's only interested in finding that bobby dick and seeking revenge this is blasphemy according to many you know blasphemy is uh, acting against the will of god right so uh, when we are acting on our own when we try to think we are superior we are something we are the salt of the earth you remember that right that's a biblical phrase in such cases we really feel that the person is blasphemous so we were discussing the characters we have reached elijah uh, and stuff so now we'll be looking at perth perth is really is important because we now know that the story of moby dick uh, is told to us only by ishmael so ishmael is alive only because of that canoe shaped chest designed by perth the carpenter actually perth is a blacksmith i'm so sorry so it is a uh, perth is a ship's blacksmith the story is an unusual departure for melville as it is told with the excessive sentimentality and predictability of melodrama then we have a gabriel gabriel is also important see here we have a few mystic creatures i mean mystic uh, characters actually gabriel elijah fedela all these people they are a bit uh, different from the rest actually even ahab is different but elijah gabriel and fedela all these people behave with some mysterious uh, traits they have some magic magical beliefs i say then bildad bildad is a hypocritical sorry hypocritical faker the corners exchange regarding ishmael's play allows melville an opportunity for little caustic satire see why he is called a hypocritical faker you remember uh, because at the outset bildad uh, asked ishmael how much money he requires as a remuneration whatever ishmael asks he gives him only one less than what he offers what he is asked okay so in that way uh, he is very hypocritical he doesn't expect he doesn't uh, behave as religion says okay so these are the main characters of course there are many more characters you know the chapters are lengthy enough so we'll now look into the characterization of the chief characters so ishmael is the chief character despite his centrality to the story ishmael doesn't reveal much about himself to the reader we know that he has gone to see out of some spiritual melancholy and that shipping aboard a whaler is his version of committing suicide see how wonderful it is committing suicide is actually an experience of moving away from life he is also doing the same thing he is moving away from his life whatever personal life he may be having he just have a reference of a dream where he sees of his step mother but you know isn't this a wonderful way of committing suicide it's all it so he believes that men aboard a whaling ship are lost to the world that's really they don't hear anything about the land it is apparent from ishmael's frequent digressions on a wide range of subjects from art geology anatomy to legal codes and literature that he is intelligent and well educated yet he claims that a whaling ship has been his yale college and harvard see uh, we know herman melville talking about ishmael and moby dick and his experiences in the sea as his yale and harvard you know that yale and harvard are the most renowned 
because it is in America. So whatever he gets to know of world is whatever he gave his experiences as a voyager, as a sailor, or rather a whaler in these ships. He seems to be a self-taught Renaissance man, good at everything but committed to nothing. Remember, many people, even of our own era, devise their knowledge from self-reading. So, uh, likewise, in that particular age, Ishmael was a man who is self-taught, good at everything but committed to nothing. Given the mythic romantic aspects of Moby Dick, it is perhaps fitting that its narrator should be an enigma with everything in the story so dependent on fate and the seemingly supernatural needs to make perfect sense. So Ishmael can't be briefed in such a small character sketch. It's much more, you know that, right? So Ishmael is very much interested in the anatomy of the whales. So there is frequent res references to cetology actually. Cetology is a study of marine mammals. Now we will uh, proceed into the next character that is Ahab. Ahab, the Picard's obsessed captain, represents both an ancient and a quintessentially modern type of hero. Like the heroes of Greek and Shakespearean tragedy, Ahab suffers from a single fatal flow but he shares with such legendary characters as Oedipus and Faust. Remember, almost great classical literature, almost great, every great tragedy has a tragic character with a tragic flow. And also could be rightly called a tragic character with a fatal flow. One, he shares with such legendary characters as Oedipus and Faust. Remember them, right? His tremendous overconfidence or his hubris leads him to defy common sense and believe that like a god, he can enact his will and remain immune to the forces of nature. Isn't it a bit of folly actually? He considers Moby Dick the embodiment of evil in the world and he pursues the white veil monomaniacally because he believes in his inescapable faith to destroy this evil. So, crazily, he's after Moby Dick, the whale, and that is no positive thing according to the world. How can a man be after one particular individual, unique, distinct whale? There are many whales, right? If he could get something uh, from a veil that could be from any veil but no this case is very particular he looks into that individual veil in orbiting unlike the heroes of older tragic works however ahab suffers from a fatal flow that is not necessarily inborn but instead stems from damage In this case, both psychological and physical, inflicted by life in a harsh world. He is a victim as well as an aggressor. He is a, a symbolic opposition that he constricts between himself and Mopedic propels him toward what he considers a destined end. So after knowing who Ishmael is and after knowing who Ahab is, let's now look a bit about Moby Dick. Moby Dick is not a character because we don't have the access to the uh, Moby Dick's feelings, thoughts, intentions. Instead, we can consider it an, as an impersonal force. I mean, uh, just like nature, just like rain, just like a tsunami, just like a landslide, we can consider Moby Dick, an impersonal force. Why I said all these disasters is that at the end of the day, at the end of the novel, after three days vigorous chase, we find nobody alive but Ishmael. So, 
for many lives, Moby Dick is an impersonal force like a calamity even. Uh, some critics consider Moby Dick to be an allegorical representation of God. Nobody has seen or felt God, right? So here, a Moby Dick is found, he is quoted, but he is not defeated. Uh, considering the pursuit of Ahab after Moby Dick could be considered one's pursuit of God. Here, in some extent. He is an inscrutable and all powerful being that humankind can neither understand or defy. So, no one can understand or defy this mysterious creature called Obedic. His free will cannot be defeated. See, there are many occasions how this uh, fights or rather chases occur. He or Obedic can't be defeated actually, at least in the ambit of the novel. He cannot be accommodated. Where do we accommodate Moby Dick? Or he cannot be avoided. Ahab could not avoid him. Ahab could not accommodate him. Ahab could not defeat him. No one could defeat him, right? Then, as Ishmael points out, the majority of a veil is hidden from you all the time. Isn't it right? Has anyone seen a veil in its entirety? Because our vision is very limited, right? A veil mirrors its environment. Like the veil, only the surface of the ocean is available for human observation and interpretation, while its depth conceals unknown and unknowable truths. Furthermore, even Ishmael does get his hands on a whole veil. See, we know Ishmael is very much fond of seatology. Ishmael is very much familiar with the mammals in the sea. He, he, he has made references even as chapters as seatology. But even he doesn't understand what in actually Moby Dick is. We know that he has seen Moby Dick once and twice and thrice. Furthermore, even when Ishmael goes uh, get his hands on a whole wheel, he is unable to determine which part, that is the skeleton head, the skin, offers the best understanding of the whole living, breathing creature. He cannot localize the essence of the wheel. Who can focus, who can concentrate the essence of the wheel, who can concentrate upon the essence of spirituality, the essence of God, all these things are, are not concrete in it. And he is also unable to explain what Obedic actually is about. This conundrum can be read as a metaphor for the human relationship with the Christian God or any other God for that matter. That is, God is unknowable and cannot be pinned down. God is a phenomenon, a concept, an idea to many a spiritual force that cannot be pinned down to a particular speci speciality. You get it, right? God is a concept or idea that cannot be pinpointed, that cannot be known for sure, known for finite. God is not uh, so clear and so rigid. That's a concept. That is an abstract concept, right? Yeah, yeah. There is a question from Gopika. Uh, she has asked that, is this comparable to Greek tragedy with Ahab as the tragic hero with the hamartia of pride or arrogance? Okay, Gopika. Nice uh, for your query. And as if you for asking the question, yes, to a great extent, we can consider this Hamashia and hubris in the nature of Ahab. As I told you, Ahab is monomaniacal in his pursuit of Moby Dick. That one thing is this hubris. It's not the 
monomaniacal approach or rather test for the Vedic. It is his thought that he is supreme above all other creatures. It is his thought that he is uh, unbeatable. It is his thought that nothing can happen to him. He will find it. He will uh, succeed in killing and defeating Vedic. These concepts are actually too far-fetched. These are beyond normalcy. That is why people consider uh, Ahab's madness itself maddening. You get me? That is the quest for his uh, his quest for searching Morbidic is actually a monomaniacal aspect that is evolved out of his hubris. His hamartia, his hubris, could be compared to other Greek and great classical tragedies. That is the opinion of many great critics. So we have some biblical allusions. Biblical allusions uh, refer to the allusions or references from Bible. As I mentioned uh, in between, there are allusions to Ishmael, Lazarus, Ahab, and the like. Ishmael's allusion is that he was the illegitimate son uh, of Abraham and Hagar. Abraham was married to Sarah. Sarah and Abraham didn't have a child. So uh, Abraham uh, had a child in his maidservant Hagar and that child was Ishmael. So just like I mean, uh, we can say Ishmael was exiled from his land. That is why uh, this is given. See the court. The angel of the Lord said to her, He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and his every man's hand against him. The biblical Ishmael had to leave his land. As we know, our protagonist Ishmael also had to leave his land for this expedition. Another character is Lazarus. Lazarus uh, is brought in chapter 49 where Ishmael is brought back to life. So here he calls, I felt all the easier. A stone was rolled away from my heart. Besides all the days, I should live now. I should now live would be as good as the days that Lazarus lived after his resurrection. It is said that Lazarus was uh, resurrected three days after his uh, death, just like how Jesus Christ was resurrected from his death. Next is Ahab. Ahab, as I told you uh, earlier, was, a, was an evil king of Israel who didn't worship their God, but who believed in the God called Baal. Okay, so there was some reference of Elijah versus Ahab. Elijah is a prophet in Bible 2 who warns Ahab of things, but he doesn't listen to that. He does a, the biblical Israeli king doesn't listen to Elijah. Even now we know in Mobedic also, Abraham or Ahab doesn't, I'm sorry, Ahab doesn't listen to any, anyone, even Perela, even Ishmael, even Starbuck, even Elijah. No one does he listen to. So another um, character we should think about is actually Leviathan. Leviathan is the name used for whale, a very large whale. Actually, it is a magnitude, a larger magnitude, a greater than that of a whale. Okay. So Ishmael's description of the interior of a whale, uh, while describing the interior of a whale, he describes Leviathan. So the biblical Leviathan is a large sea creature described by God himself. So in his sermon, even Father Maple reminds everyone of Jonah's pursuit. Jonah uh, happens to be inside the fish. You will be seeing that in the next slide. Please look at the picture now. Jonah, Jonah uh, happens to be, happens to go inside this great bay. And there it is the Leviathan. So Jonah is another biblical character. I have got another question. What are the literal and symbolic importance of homoeroticism in Morbidic? Actually, 
in all the 135 chapters, you might come across such moro, homoeroticism. Also, uh, there are certain uh, movies and adaptations made. But here, more than uh, ero being erotic, there is a bonding also. Okay? A bonding as a brother to brother, a bonding as a friend to friend. Since I mentioned earlier that in Picard there is uh, only uh, in Picard there are only men and no women, yeah, there is a scope of reading uh, homoerotic elements and the literal meaning you know that right, uh, having an attachment towards a uh, same gender is what is called homoeroticism, and symbolic significance is uh, we shall see that um, I mean the gender. Uh, the symbolic significance is actually, yeah, it is beyond the friendship. It is beyond two persons. Actually, you might have uh, mistook it from Pickett's word, or Pickett's uh, word of marriage that we will be coming later. Okay, there the marriage means only approval of words. I'll check into this uh, later and explain to you privately. Okay, so when we look at the slide that uh, deals with the term marriage, we'll discuss it there. Thank you, Surina. So we have uh, met Jonah and the Leviathan. Now we'll look at the another important thing. Uh, it is Picot, right? Yeah. The Picot is the name of the ship, okay? Uh, actually, the Picot is a type of escape. Every people getting uh, from land from to another scape, we shall say. So there we can have a microcosm of the world. The Hebrew meaning of this word listens back to the Melville's most important themes, that is transcendental belief in the presence of God in the natural world. I hope you are uh, familiar with the transcendental belief. American literature, particularly uh, that of uh, Emerson and Thoreau uh, really wanted, really focused on transcendentalism. So its occurrence in the Bible is directly associated with human encounters with their God and with God's presence and absolute power. Picard is magically ambivalent. Actually, there was uh, an island called Nehat Picard. Occurrence in the Bible is directly associated with human encounters with their God and God's presence and absolute power. Picard is a magically ambivalent word. It connotes both the terrible and destructive vengeance of God and the wonderful starvation of divine deliverance. It's a paradoxical sense of both deliverance and punishment. So Picard just means divine salvation. So most of the people get sal uh, salvation to their death. This is the literal meaning of the word Picard. Another a biblical allusion is Elijah, the biblical prophet. I have mentioned it earlier too. That is the Elijah's, uh, the prophecy made by the biblical Elijah to the Egypt, the king, the Israeli king Ahab is similar to the prophecy made by Melville's Elijah towards Ahab through to the characters of Peter and Ishmael. So next is about cetology in Mobidic. Cetology, as I told you earlier, is a branch of mammal science. Uh, Mobidic, in Mobidic, Melville describes in detail. Okay, next we are discussing about the themes. Okay, uh, the main themes are limits of knowledge, fate and free will, revenge, man's relationship with nature, Base, comradeship and enslavement, madness, religion, Christian and pagan worship. So limits of knowledge, we have already tried to explain that with Ishmael's narration, we come to know everything and we know what the limits of knowledge are there. And about fate, naturally, fate determines life. With only one character remaining, to tell the life, to tell their tell his story and the story of others, 
we know that phase is very much significant there. Now we are talking about nature and man. Okay. Uh, yeah. Whaling is an experiment. Whaling is an experience of exploring the nature. Just like that, we all human beings have been exploring the nature, the world, from the origin of the world itself, right? Ever since men started living, that exploration has been continuing. Then, race, fellowship, and enslavement. As I told you, race is important. Uh, but you should also remember, though an Aborigine, he was, Pickwick was very much more mature, very much more sane, very much more civilized in certain aspects than others. So fellowship is a companionship that uh, Ishmael had with Pickwick. Then enslavement, as I told you, all the superior tasks are performed by uh, the white men and the others by the Aborigines. Now we are saying about madness, as I told you earlier, madness is actually done by, madness is the concern we will be, madness and religion. These are another two importance. So after that, we should think about Santiago, uh, a great uh, work from another American novel, that is uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, Santiago and Ehef, the contrast. When we know that Santiago uh, pursued, uh, Santiago's pursuit for her, was the most struggle for livelihood it was not revenge, whereas for Ahab it was madness, obsession, and revenge. So these are a few adaptations in the form of series, novels, and movies. So uh, conclude, I would say these are a few favorite quotes I come across from the Mobile. Think not is my eleventh commandment. And sleep when you can is my care. Better to sleep with a cannibal, and better to sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunk Christian. Ignorance is the parent of fear. I draw all, I try all things. I achieve what I can. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are better forever. It is not down on any map. Two places never are. See how elastic our prejudices grow when once love comes to bend them. In this world, shipmates, sin that pays it we can travel freely and without a passport. There is virtue as a pumper, a storm at all frontiers. So, for further references, you may look into these sites and I thank you all. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you for this informative class. Focus you again this platform again. This online class is provided by Government of Kerala through us. There is a lot of effort being put to for conducting this class at us. So I request all of you guys to share the news regarding this class. And so that each of you become a responsible citizen and work along with this government in this COVID period. I repeat, you can support government effort in this period by sharing news regarding this class so that pupils in need of this class can join. So thanking you all again for joining this class. Thank you ma'am again.